Hello? Okay, great. So um, I'm going to talk about income distribution, uh, but functional, uh, the, the functional income distribution, that is the distribution of income uh, between factors of production. And um, let, let me, okay, sorry, sorry. That's, that's joint work with uh, Andres Davila now at Zurich, uh, Manuel Fernandez uh, at uh, Los Andes, and myself. So um, there's a lot of uh, recent literature about the decline of lab labor income share. There are like, I don't know, at least 10 papers I can recall now uh, describing a global decrease in labor income share. But um, this, uh, um, this stylized fact um, has something beyond. Uh, in particular, uh, when, when we talk about, for instance, uh, uh, direct uh, technological change, uh, we think about both uh, labor-saving innovations and skill bias innovations. So the story, uh, let's say, we, we will have to look not only at labor income share, but at raw labor income share, human capital income share, and when we go to the capital income, we may have to take a look at uh, reproducible capital income share, namely physical capital, uh, and natural capital income share. So uh, this is what we do. We discuss how to measure uh, factor income shares, taking into account these four factors of production. Uh, we propose a methodology to have these, these measures, and then we build a data set. Um, um, as, as I was saying before, decoupling, uh, at then we, we, we see the evolution of all these shares, and uh, we, we um, decouple this evolution um, looking at prices, factor prices, and uh, average factor productivity. Uh, so, so let me go to the, to the, um, to the paper. So we, we built this, this data set for 55 countries between, for all the years between 1995 and 2015. Um, then we describe this, this, um, uh, this data, and we highlight, uh, so we add two, two very important distinctions. The first one I, I already told you, um, we, can, um, we can talk about reproducible and not reproducible factors, but also we can uh, we can see the evolution of these factor shares for high income and low and middle income uh, countries um, in a separate way. Um, and, and then finally, as I was saying before, we have this, this uh, we can decouple the evolution of factor shares. Finally, uh, we, we suggest some uh, possible explanations. So let me go to the methodology. Uh, I will go very fast. If someone wants to discuss in detail what we do, um, we can do it later. So uh, there are, as I was telling you before, w there are lots of papers describing the evolution of uh, labor income shares. Uh, there are some papers um, w w where they build uh, a panel in general, there are small uh, panels. Uh, some of these panels uh, separate um, physical capital from, um, from natural capital. Um, then we have, we have this, this, um, this set of papers, uh, Caselli and Fair, they, they separate natural capital and physical capital. Then we, you, uh, Sturgill, uh, he, he, he builds a database with the four factors, but in general there are small, small databases. Um, okay, in any case, uh, what, what we do is uh, we have the whole dynamics, and with all due respect, I think we have a better methodology than, than Sturgill. So let me go fast. What we do, sorry, no. No, so fast. 
Okay, so what we do first is we take, uh, we compute total labor shares. This is Streamleaf's standard. We take uh, uh, the Penroll data tables and we follow the methodology of, of uh, Golin, um, Bernanke, etc. Um, this, is, this, this is quite standard. Then we split uh, labor income between human capital and raw labor uh, using um, uh, set like an LAS um, data sets. What we do is we run uh, mean set regressions for all countries and all years, and then we recover the, the constant in all of these regressions, uh, and we, we assume this is the raw labor income. Uh, and then the, the, the remaining income is, is uh, human capital income. Um, we have, uh, for data availability, uh, we, we, we fill some gaps using, using um, um, predicting using um, artificial intelligence. Uh, then, to separate between physical capital and natural capital, we use the methodology of Caselli and Feder. What they do is, th there's this data set from the World Bank, where they have um, uh, natural capital, uh, yes, natural capital for the, the whole uh, set of countries. And what they do is they assume the return to investment of, uh, in the two types of capital is the same, and then uh, they compute uh, natural capital income. We do exactly the same. Um, now, let's go to the results. So this is the first result. Here we have total labor income. Ah, okay, this is the global income. What we do is we weight it by uh, GDP. Okay, so here we have total labor income, and as in the almost all the papers, uh, we have this decline in labor income from 1995 to 2015. However, once we split. Uh, human capital and, and, and raw labor share, what we see is that the decrease in labor income is completely driven by raw labor. Indeed, human capital income share is going up. It's, it, it doesn't have a clear trend, but uh, uh, what, what we have is an increase in human capital share. So, first extremely important message, the decrease in labor income share is driven by raw labor income. Now, we can split th this graph, we can see the graph for high income countries and low and middle income countries. So if we see for high income countries, it looks pretty much the same as uh, the previous one, yes? We have a decrease in labor income share, basically driven by a decrease in raw labor share and an increase in human capital share. Let's see what happens when we uh, see low and middle in income countries. The story is completely different. What we see is first a, 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 a steep decrease in uh, labor income share and then a recovery. So at the end of the period, labor income share is basically the same as it was at the beginning of the period. And part of the decrease is driven by raw labor share and part is driven by um, human capital share. First big, uh, big difference. So, what we see here is driven, sorry, here is driven by uh, high income countries, okay? Now, if we take a look at not shares, but the income, so, Again, um, we start from 1995, and we see that for high-income countries, uh, total in labor income goes up. You have this small decrease, which is the, the, the crisis, uh, the financial crisis, but in general it goes up, and the, um, the human capital income goes up. But it's different when we talk about raw labor income. Raw labor income goes up until 2001, and then it's basically uh, flat. It was a small increase at the end of the period. When we talk about 
and low and middle income countries, uh, there's a, a decrease uh, by the beginning of the century, but in general you have a positive, tre positive trend for uh, labor income, human capital income, and it's a little, let's say, the, the increase is smaller for uh, raw labor, uh, but uh, again, we have an increase in raw labor income. So, and you may be asking, how come? You, you see this huge decrease in, in, in uh, uh, labor income, share, what is going on? So basically, you will see what is happening when we take a look at the income share of, of uh, natural, natural resources. Basically, let me go on. So here we have capital factor shares. So total capital share, physical capital share, and natural, natural resources share for all countries. So you have small decrease until 2001, and then an increase uh, uh, until the end of the period. However, if you, if you take a look at natural resources share, it goes a small decrease, and then a small increase, and then it, it ends up in the same level. This movement is basically commodity prices. Uh, here you have the, you have the boom, commodity prices boom, and then you have the reversal of the boom. Um, it affects a little bit um, uh, the sample. When, when you take a look at only at uh, high-income countries, it looks pretty much, much the same. When you go to uh, low- and middle-income countries, then the story is different. You have uh, the, the movements in natural resources share is huge here. And um, it's, it's driven a whole reallocation of, 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 uh, of factors, income, um, along the period. So you have first a decrease, then the boom, and then the end of the boom comes with a, a decrease in natural resources share. With total capital and physical capital, you see physical capital first goes up, then goes down, and ends up in the, in the same uh, level. Now, uh, that's uh, capital income. Uh, it's, it's basically for the three types of, so for total capital, physical capital, and natural uh, resources, it's basically the same. Again, you have this decrease uh, in the middle of the crisis. Uh, and this is, is the story for, um, uh, low and middle uh, income economies, uh, you first have this decrease and then uh, a huge increase uh, coinciding with the um, uh, commodity prices uh, boom. Okay. Now, so th that's the data set. Of course, we have all 55 countries uh, for data for whole, all the countries, uh, all, the, all the years, so you can take a look at all uh, each one of the, of, the, of the countries. But <clears throat> we can decompose the movements. Do I have the time? I'm going to, okay. So this is, this is any factor share. Yeah, you have here, uh, R is the price of the share, F is the factor, and Y is GDP. So that's the factor's income share. So we can decompose the increase or in, in, in uh, the factor share, just you have the, the change in the factor price minus the change in the uh, average factor productivity. When I say average factor productivity, uh, it's as opposed to marginal factor productivity. Okay? Uh, in general, people talk about factor productivity, uh, but w w we prefer to, to talk about average factor productivity uh, to, to distinguish. Mm, with um, other, uh, marginal factor productivity. So we, take, we do this for all the factors, and this is what we find. So here we have, uh, for high-income countries, that's the, the uh, total labor share, and what we see is that average labor productivity goes above uh, factor prices. Uh, here we can interpret this in two ways. One is like a political way or uh, institutional way or uh, bargaining way, which is, look, um, firms are, uh, are getting a higher part of the production of each worker, and this 
for this reason, we have this redistribution from workers to firms. The other way is, you know, you have robotization, we have uh, bias technological change, and uh, firms need less workers, and for this reason, um, uh, factor prices are going, oh, wages are going below um, average labor productivity. Now, when we uh, mm, mm, analyze the same numbers for low and middle income countries, what we see is, again, first a huge decrease and then a recovery. Uh, but you know, um, in any case, what we see is that compared to 1995, in general, average labor productivity is above uh, is above um, uh, average wage. So it's like during these years, we have either a change in bargaining power uh, uh, in favor of firms or some type of um, uh, labor-saving innovations. Again, take a look at the, the whole story, you end up with basically the same uh, labor income share. We can move to human capital, in human capital, it goes the other way around. You see that uh, the, the share of human capital uh, ends up being higher than at the beginning, and it, it means basically that um, the average productivity is growing less than the, um, the price of human capital, basically the return to investment in human capital. When we go to um, low- and middle-income countries, um, we have <clears throat> uh, basically uh, the, the, the story is, 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 is uh, different. You have average uh, uh, human capital productivity above, um, above um, wages. Okay, for, again, for raw labor share, what you see is uh, for high income countries, a huge decrease in raw labor shares. Uh, in other words, average raw labor productivity is uh, above um, uh, raw labor prices. And for uh, low and middle income countries, um, you have basically the same thing, but it ends, uh, the, the difference ends up disappearing in the long run. Uh, when we talk about capital and physical capital, you see that. Uh, at the end of the period, the uh, cap physical capital share is higher, so it seems that indeed capital is getting a bigger part of the share of the, of the, of the pie. Uh, and again, it, 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 it's explained because uh, you have um, uh, capital, um, capital, um, sorry, you, you have capital return to capital uh, above um, above uh, capital productivity. Now, when you go to low- and middle-income countries, this is not the case. It, you, begin with, um, uh, you begin with the same story, like um, the, the, the return is higher than the average uh, productivity, but, but then uh, um, uh, this, this difference disappears, and there's no increase in the long run in uh, capital income share. Okay, uh, with uh, natural resources, basically, it's, it's basically flat, the, the, the behavior of, of, um, of natural resources income share for rich economies, but when we talk about uh, middle income, here you see the commodity price, the, the, the commodity cycle, yes? First, um, average productivity is above uh, capital return, but then you have a, this huge increase in prices, uh, the return to investment in, in, in natural capital uh, is, is higher now than a natural resources share, and you have these this years uh, with a big increase in, in, in natural returns share. Then the, pri the boom go comes to an end, and you end up with a sm uh, slightly slow, uh, lower uh, natural resources share. That's the story. Possible explanations. Of course, this is like an invitation to write new papers using this database. Um, but here you have an interesting dynamics with two global shocks. You have the natural resource boom, 
which uh, explains basically the movements in natural resource share that may explain. And you have the international financial crisis that uh, puts some, some noise into the, into the behavior of um, resource, um, shares. You may have a story of factor saving innovations in rich economies. Yeah. And it makes sense, rich economies are more abundant in reproducible factors, so they have more incentives to invest in labor-saving innovations. And you see they are also more abundant in human capital, so they, they have more incentives to uh, implement um, skilled, uh, skilled uh, um, biased innovations. So the story, the long-run story, is consistent with factor-saving innovations in uh, Low and middle uh, income economies, you don't see this in the long run. Now, you may also have a story of international trade, because the H. Rowling uh, model will predict exactly the same regarding factor shares uh, if you think that uh, um, high income economies are trading with low and middle income economies. You can also think about a story of evolution of market power, uh, basically, uh, with um, a reduction, uh, let's say, an increase in market power for capital-intensive uh, economies, um, firms, etc. Uh, here, I didn't show this, but there, there's a, a very interesting fact: is it seems to be convergence in factor shares. When we have the whole, the whole sample, and, and we draw um, convergence graphs, it seems that we have convergence. I think there's a beautiful paper as well there. It can be, this convergence could be if you believe the story of factor-saving innovations um, and there's technological uh, transfers, you may have a story there. Um, you may also think about uh, labor market institutions. I, I, I will not go uh, deeper there. So, big conclusions. Um, there are heterogeneities in two dimensions. First, the movements in reproducible and non-reproducible factor shares are completely different. The story of the decrease in labor income share is the story of the decrease in raw labor income share. Second, uh, the story of, uh, the, let's say, the, the, the behavior is different in uh, middle, low um, and middle income economies and in uh, high income economies. Um, okay, this is repetition, uh, but the most important uh, message here is that we provide a new factor shares data set, which I think provides new understanding of, of tools for new ways of understanding the movements in, in uh, factor shares. And that's it. That's it. Thank you very much.